So whenever my uh, my board chair says to me, "Hey, you should uh, you should speak to someone," <laughs> I typically perk up and listen. And so you came to my attention via my board chair, Christy Plot. How do you you live in Wyoming? How do you know Christy in Georgia? So uh, my mom, Karen Bud Fallon, worked in the Trump administration. She was an attorney for Fish and Wildlife Service and National Parks. And through her job there, she got to know Christy. And I think now she occasionally does some legal work. Your mother. Yes. And so then um, I really, really wanted to go alligator hunting. Um, and so in 2020 during COVID, my mom said, I know this lady that could probably take you alligator hunting. And so we went down to Louisiana actually from Wyoming and Christy took us alligator hunting and that's how I got to know her. Christy herself took you alligator hunting? Well, Christy knows, uh, the folks that took us so she went on the trip trip with us but um yeah she's the one who set it all up yeah that makes sense that makes sense i was just gonna because she has recently become a hunter do you know that i do know that um she's been going with kate mcgregor who also worked in the trump administration and is one of my mom's best friends And it was so funny. We were visiting Kate last May and um, Kate had been alligator hunting and got an alligator bag. And I was saying, you know, we have a friend named Christy. You should really meet her. And then literally like two weeks later, they happened to both be on a women's hunt. And so they had met immediately after. I was like, you know, you would really like Christy. You'd get along really well. And and now they go on all kinds of hunts together. Yeah. So. I was a part of that initial meeting because, (laughs) yes, uh, because I was at DSC with Christy and we were with the FTW SAM guys and they said, hey, we're going to sign Christy up. It's going to be a woman's beginner's hunt deal. Christy's going to be involved. Erica Turgeson from DSC is going to be involved. Uh, PJ Carlton's going to be involved from CSF. And they were going to invite a couple of other people. And Tim was like, hey, Robbie, you need to be a part of this. And I said, Tim, this is a girl's weekend. Like, <laughs> I, and I've not, I'm, it's not like I've never hunted before. He's like, ah, just put his name down. Put his name down. We'll just put him out. We'll just add him there. I was like, all right, all right, all right. Well, then we found out uh, we get put on a group message and whatnot. And there's this other girl coming called Kate McGregor. And she's got like transportation issues. And she texted me. She's like, would you be able to pick me up from Austin? Because they knew I was driving in. I was going to pick people up from the airport and do all the sorts of things. So that's how I met McGregor. I met her in a random... um, shopping mall parking lot where i got transferred her into my vehicle and uh yeah we just had a fabulous three four days with ftw and christy and kate and got they all got to know each other they formed like i think it's called the the triple g's i'm I'm messing it up so christy kate sorry it's like the girl gun gang or something like that i don't know (laughs) and that's what uh that's what came about for everything so small world small circles it really is, especially when you get in the area of natural resources. It seems like everybody is connected somehow. So, Sarah Fallon, welcome to the Blood Origins podcast. Uh, super excited to talk with you. Uh, give somebody who's listening who may not know who you are, what you know, who are you, what do you do, where do you live? Absolutely. So I am a sixth generation Wyoming ranch kid, and I actually still live on our ranch, but I live in a fifth wheel camper trailer in the middle of one of our cow pastures. Um, I get water from our cattle stock tank. Um, My husband and I both live in this camper together, and he works on our ranch full time. 
Um, I work on the ranch sort of part-time now. Um, right now we're calving, so it's a very busy time of year. But I have a law degree. Um, both of my parents are also attorneys, and they do agriculture and natural resources law. And since both of them also grew up on ranches, they really saw a lot of the legal problems that farmers and ranchers and anybody who wants to use land run into. Um, and when our industries get so complicated because of various you know, regulations and laws, um, and so growing up with two rancher lawyer parents, um, I have always been very interested in these laws and regulations that impact agriculture. So uh, after I graduated from undergrad, I went to the University of Wyoming. I um, got degrees in agriculture communication and environment and natural resources, decided to go to law school, figured I would be following right in their footsteps. Um, though I've taken a different path about uh, six months after I graduated from law school, I had been working at my parents' law firm and I was working on a case that I was very, we'll call it passionate about. Okay. Um, and I was really upset about the, the outcome of this case. And so um, I made a TikTok about the case and I don't really know why I did it because I had never done anything like that before. But I made this TikTok and it got like half a million views in less than 24 hours, um, which for somebody who did not have a very successful um, social media page previous to that um, was quite a shock. And all of a sudden I had people reaching out to me about what can we do about this legal issue? How can we help? Um, I had always thought that people didn't care about agriculture issues. And what I really realized is that um, they just don't know about these different agriculture issues. And I had folks from New York and New Hampshire and like the East Coast and the West Coast um, reaching out to me. And so from that one specific experience, I decided to start posting about um, environmental laws and regulations and how they're negatively impacting, you know, not just, um, you know, ranching, which is what I grew up in, but all kinds of farming, logging, um, energy production. Um, the outdoors and hunting community also deals with these kinds of laws all the time. And what I found is people really don't understand them. And so I try to use social media to educate people about these laws and why they can be so problematic, not only for the industries, but in a lot of cases really aren't helping the environment either. Mm. Um, and so now I do some lobbying work. I take groups of farmers um, or ranchers back to Washington, D.C. occasionally um, to try to change some of these problematic laws. I try to bring um, public attention to specific cases where sometimes a legal solution isn't always enough and you have to change public perception. And so I work on our law cases really from that education and really like a public relations perspective, which yeah, has given me a very like, interesting job. Sounds like, sounds like Blood Origins. I, I think so. I've been following you guys on Instagram for, for quite a while, and it, it sounds like that's what you do, too. So <laughs> love to be in the in the same same boat as other inter industries. Yeah, public relations, explaining things, breaking it down to to being sort of digestible to, you know, from politicians to Joe Blow on the street. You know, what does this policy mean? How can you fight it? what is it what it's its effect going to be how stupid is it <laughs> why is it stupid you know that kind of stuff is right up Absolutely. our wheelhouse yeah I, I spend a lot of time saying you know this law sounds like a great idea you, you know out here in the universe i can see why somebody passed this it sounds like a great idea practically it does not work and let me tell you why it's not working are you, uh, is mom and dad still on the farm? They are. Um, so my mom is still working completely full time as an attorney. 
Um, she worked in the Trump administration and then she she came home um, after that. And she said that she actually likes throwing rocks at the federal government a lot more than she liked working in the federal government. And so um, she came back home and geared up to fight at all of the inevitable changes that the Biden administration was going to make in her you know, realm of expertise, which they have absolutely been doing. And my dad works, I think he's starting to try to retire from the law firm and he's spending a lot more time with um, our cows uh, than he is in the law firm, but he he's still working there as well. Is there plans for, are you building a house? Is that why you're, you're living in the fifth wheel right now? So I started living in the fifth wheel um, because I had, I went straight through undergrad and law school and I was so tired of living in town. Um, and so I decided that I would just buy the camper and park it in our cow pasture, which works really well. Most of the year, the winter in Wyoming is a little rough. Um, uh, my husband and I are actually expecting our first child. And so congratulations. Um, we are, thank you. Yeah. So we are actively trying to figure out a different plan because the camper trailer isn't a super practical way to have a baby so <laughs> it will be super if it if it isn't confining now it'll be incredibly confining when you have a screaming two-week-old yes <laughs> yeah luckily we still have um you know quite a few months to figure it out but um we're actively working on the next plan <laughs> So uh, the reason we, we, we connected was because Christy sent me a video of yours. And it's something that I've been really, really looking at since I, I, I saw your video. And it's quite, quite interesting. And your video was about, and maybe you can give us some context to why you decided to put a video like that out there. It was, it was a video about, I'm going to call them anti-hunting organizations. Um, I think you would turn them as animal rights organizations. They all seem to, and, and, and granted, I'm not going to, you know, I guess when any nonprofit gets massive, things like this happen. But your video was, hey, look at all these guys in these animal rights organizations and how much money is going to salaries and it was it was really mind-blowing yeah absolutely so i like to call them radical environmentalist groups um and this is something that i have researched several times actually um it's sort of a long story, but one of the biggest laws that we are constantly fighting is the Endangered Species Act. And okay. the reason we're fighting it is when an endangered species is found in a certain area and the species gets listed, um, critical habitat is designated and it cuts off nearly all use of that land. Um, and so... This is obviously a big problem, you know, especially in agriculture and industry. You can no longer use these lands. Um, in the cases of private property, these landowners are not being compensated to not be able to use their land. They are just told, sorry, you cannot adversely modify this habitat anymore, which is detrimental to any kind of a land use industry. Um, and while they do this, um, a lot of people tout the Endangered Species Act as being successful because the big statistic is that um, only 1% of species have ever gone extinct from the endangered species list. But from my perspective, the point of the Endangered Species Act is not to keep species perpetually listed forever. Um, it's supposed to be about recovering species, which the Endangered Species Act has around a 3% success rate right. at that. Right. which I think is abysmal. Um, we've had it for 51 years and it is terribly unsuccessful at its goal about actually recovering at-risk species. 
And, you know, I think that we can all agree nobody wants any species to go extinct. Correct. But you can't just shut down all of the industries at the same time as not recovering the species. That's what I have a problem with. And so one of the organizations that we fight constantly, the one of these radical environmental organizations, is the Center for Biological Diversity. And okay. they are one of those huge nonprofits that are extremely litigious. Um, they were, it seems like my parents' when law someone, firm is when you say When you say extremely litigious, explain that. What does that mean? So they are constantly suing um, the federal government over species that they think are not having enough money thrown at them. Um, they say that the species are not being protected well enough. And while I agree these species are not being protected well enough because they're not being recovered, but a lot of times these groups are so anti-use that they think that the only way to protect these species is by shutting down more industries, taking more land from the working or, or recreational people. Um, and so they are constantly suing the federal government. And where so, this ties into how much money they're making is because they are a nonprofit, is supposedly a nonprofit organization, they get attorney's fees paid back to them from the Equal Access to Justice Act. What do you the mean? No, no, hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's just, let's, let me back up one second before we get into that, because that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. I want to know, you're, you're, you're an attorney. What if can anybody sue the federal government? Like I'm just like because anybody could say anything, right? They, it 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 could be absolutely asinine. So and does it go through immediately? Like, yep, stop this because we're suing you, and you're like, but that's the worst idea in the world. <laughs> um. So no, it does not quite work like that. You have to have standing, and so you have to have. There, there's a couple of ways to get standing. Most of the time it's through um, like an injury that you have right now. You know, I'm being hurt by this law. I have a constitutional right that's being taken away from this law. Um, and so you have to be able to prove that, you know, there is some constitutional violation normally. Okay. Um, however, there are specific laws like the Endangered Species Act that have causes of action written into them. So the Endangered Species Act, um, in attempt to make the Fish and Wildlife Service, which is the agency in charge of administering um, the Endangered Species Act, um, in, an, in an attempt to make them effective, they said that people can sue the Fish and Wildlife Service when they are violating their own law. So when the Fish and Wildlife Service is violating the Endangered Species Act, um, these organizations can sue and try to force the agency into doing something. Um, and so where this really comes into play in the Endangered Species Act is it is lined out over a lot of very strict uh, timelines. So for example, when anybody can list or petition to list a species on the endangered species list, the Fish and Wildlife Service then has 90 days to complete adequate scientific research um, to make a determination if listing would be warranted or not. Okay. Um, what the Center for Biological Diversity does is they will petition to list like a hundred species all at the same time and then give the petition to the Fish and Wildlife Service. And then when they inevitably do not complete they adequate they complete scientific research, adequate scientific they miss the 90, 90 day days. deadline. Exactly. And so then they can sue over the listing. Um, and because it was a hard deadline, uh, they are going to win the case. And then they have their attorney's fees paid back to them by the federal government because nonprofit organizations um, get Equal Access to Justice fee Act fees, which means that if you sue the government and win, you get your attorney's fees paid. Wow. And so it was really that whole racket um, that really, I think I was still maybe in high school or the beginning of college when my mom was going down this rabbit trail um, under the Paperwork Reduction Act, um, which I believe was passed also during the Clinton administration. Um, 
one of the paperwork that was reduced is a database that shows how much money is being spent through Equal Access to Justice Act fees. And so to find out the amount of money that's being spent, my mom was going and looking at every single individual Endangered Species Act case and was finding that there were millions and millions of dollars being spent just in legal fees that our tax dollars are paying these groups to be able to turn around and sue the federal government again. So let me ask this question. Are they, are these big groups, are they, do they have internal counsel that they're, they're billing or are they hiring in contractors that obviously have a much higher billing rate than an internal counsel would? Or is it a combination of both? It would depend on the group. It's going to be a combination of both. I'm sure that some of the organizations have their own counsel, but I think many of them um, hire outside law firms. And I have not, I should have looked up this number before we, um, so that it was recent when we started talking, but like a decade ago or more, when my mom was in, initially figuring this out, their attorney's fees were being paid at more than $700 an hour. Um, which I can tell you, not a single attorney in my folks' law firm is making anywhere close to that kind mm -hmm. of money. We always make jokes. We're like, too bad we have morals because we're on the wrong side. We'd be making a lot more money if we were on the other side of these issues. Jeez, absolutely crazy. Um, so, but they're also massive machines, right? They're massive, massive, massive fundraising machines. Yes, so they are, they, these radical environmental organizations have done a great job at influencing the public for a very, very long time. Yeah, um, it just didn't know, come up I, yesterday. It's been going for 10, 20, 30 years yes, now. Yeah. Yes, and they've been doing it a way longer than any kind of other industry has been really even on the internet you know most most farmers and ranchers i still know today like don't even have smartphones um you know they let alone have the time to try to be influencing the public about what it is that they do um and so there's always been a huge um imbalance of information and so that has brought us to a point where you know you have the public saying, yes, I want to support organizations that are helping the environment. And the problem is that the information that they are getting about what helps the environment is so skewed. Um, and so, for example, the um, numbers that I pulled up, and this is the research that I, I did this research about a year ago. Um, in 2021, the Center for Biological Diversity um, spent 84% of its income, which is over um, $19 million, um, uh, just of, well, it wasn't of their income, it was of their spending in the year 2021. They spent nine, over $19 million on program services. But then when you look at what program services means, 78% of that is payroll. Hmm. And so they are spending you know, a, a fraction of the amount of money that they are getting from both the taxpayers, because part of their money comes from the federal government paying them to get sued, um, and from these people who are donating to organizations just because they want to help the environment. Um, yet, they are obviously not spending their money on trying to help the environment. They're spending their money making themselves rich. Yeah, it's funny, you know, you wonder how they started. Like the Center for Biological Diversity, the people who started, they have visions of doing good for wildlife. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that suing in a certain circumstance isn't the right thing to do because it's probably the last resort. We've tried everything. This is what we're going to do to save something that we care about. Okay, get it. But there's also a whole suite of other things that you can do to save wildlife. Buy land, restore land, um, 
propagates, you know, both fauna and flora kind of thing, reintroductions, all the things that also raises a bunch of money. Absolutely. And, and it's funny that you brought that up. You wonder how they got started because I actually just earlier today looked at the Center for Biological Diversity's story and they did start in 1989 and it was just um, three men who were doing studies on, I believe it was the spotted owl um, hmm. in New Mexico. And they were worried about the populations of the owl. And so they decided to start an organization to try to help this specific species. And I do fully believe that this group and, and probably most of the rest of the others did have really good intentions. But now when they're making $30 million a year um, and spending almost none of it on land restoration or species recovery, they're spending it on litigation, which then they are being paid back tenfold. Um, it makes it very frustrating um, for those of us who are on the opposing end of these lawsuits. Sarah, let me say something controversial, not that we haven't said anything controversial yet, um, that I want to hear your reaction to it. I am very much in the camp in which if wildlife does well, if wildlife improves, population gets better, habitat gets better, that's bad for business. When it comes to an organization that is interested in saving wildlife. Thoughts? I would think that that's true. And honestly, when you started that statement, um, I thought you were going to say something that I say all the time, which is that um, I get told being in ranching that, you know, we are actively destroying the environment. And if we destroy the environment, we go out of business. So it does not make sense for us to destroy the environment. And that's why I always say that these industries are the original environmentalists. I mean, it's the same thing with hunting and outdoor industries is if we destroy the environment, our industry goes away and not to mention the world starves to death. So it's pretty big stakes and pretty big incentives for us to be the ones who want to actually save the environment. And so I think that what you said is exactly right, both from the perspective of what I just said and what is their incentive of actually saving the environment? Um, because their cash cow absolutely goes away when they don't have the federal government um, to pay them to sue. Yeah, it's uh, and also you're not tugging at people's heartstrings anymore. You absolutely, know, that's a big and thing. Th that is, I think, the hardest part of i you know i spend so much time trying to change the public perception about agriculture and everybody thinks of uh, farmers and ranchers as just these you know super old ranchers who don't care about animals you know they this, people have seen a PETA video one time of animals being mistreated and they don't think that there isn't something um just as emotional about um for example, yeah, I said we're calving right now. We had a cow give birth to a calf that was like 120 pounds, which is a huge, huge, huge calf. Um, and it caused the cow to be paralyzed in one leg. And so my husband and a couple of other guys that have been out to help us and myself um, and my dad, we've spent the last three days reteaching this cow how to walk. Um, and she's a really mean cow. So the whole time she's, she, we would like get her to stand up and then she like turns around and tries to kill us, which makes the whole thing, you know, so much more difficult, but that doesn't change that we try so hard to improve the quality of life of all of our animals. And, you know, I've also been there. You try really hard to make a calf live and it doesn't, and I'm in tears 
every single time. Mm. Um, and if you want to see an animal lover, I always tell people, go talk to farmers, ranchers, hunters, because you will not find somebody who cares more about the animals that we are working with than um, it, definitely you're not going to find someone in one of these animal rights, radical environmentalist organizations who cares a fraction as much as we do. Yeah, it's an interesting conundrum that you put forward and that we, and it happens in ranching and farming as it does in hunting, and it's this, it's either a conundrum or a paradox, whatever you want to look at it, that you purport to love the thing that you choose to kill. And yeah. it's a tough, it's tough to communicate that, but you're right in that at the end of the day, when you look at it fundamentally from either a lifestyle perspective or an economics perspective, who is, who has the greatest stake, interest stake in ensuring that the environment from a farming ranching perspective remains as healthy as possible because of the, you know, the cow's uh, need for it. And for wildlife to stay around, mm -hmm. it's hunters, because if there's no wildlife, there's nothing to hunt. So it, it's fascinating. It, and maybe it's something that we need to like really capture, I don't know, from a rhetoric perspective. You're exactly right. And part of, you know, and my, I, I should have told you this too. My, my husband is an avid hunter. He spends, um, like a month in the Bighorn Mountains every year, um, hunting elk. That is his very well, favorite time of year. And he's like distraught that we are possibly having a baby during hunting season. <laughs> um, <laughs> he's like, I'm sorry if I'm where I don't have cell phone service on top of the mountain. Um, you know, and so I understand that side of it too. But, and I think that culturally, hunters and and farmers or ranchers are very similar in that it's hard to publicly display emotion and so it's hard to get out a camera and film or take pictures of the hard thing when everybody is crying and emotional and everybody's so upset over the you know the calf we just lost or or whatever whatever it is uh, and not only is it hard to get out the camera in those times, at least in my experience, where I try really hard to get out the camera and film a lot of what we do on our ranch, but then not wanting to post it and not wanting to be vulnerable is, I think, a big cultural mm. aspect of, you know, the the folks who live off the land, the, the people who work from the land. We are very tough people and so it's hard right. to display that emotional perspective um have you watched clarkson's farm heck yes i'm halfway through season three right now i just I... finished watching the whole pig dying episode oh my god yeah yeah and that's okay so my husband and i love watching that too and i anybody who's listening to this go watch clarkson's farm it's on amazon prime it is a fantastic show um, that really shows what it is that we go through for farming. You know, I think one of my very favorite parts is at the end of the first season when Jeremy Clarkson gets to the end and he's like, after all of that, you're telling me I made a profit of 200 pounds and that's it for the whole year. It's like, yeah, welcome to farming. But, um, you know, one of the things that I think he did really, really well in this last season is they did have the episode with all the, the pigs were dying and they, they'd gotten all these piglets and, and everyone was very upset about the piglets. And then they had taken some of like, a well, I think it was only one pig to slaughter. And then the, the butcher brought, you know, the sausage and the, the pork chops and everything back over to them. And they had just been crying over these piglets. And then they were so excited to get the, the sausage and all the pork. And um, Jeremy Clarkson said, you know, I can only think of this as farmer logic, that we can be so sad that something, you know, died prematurely, um, but then so excited to get our product out of it. And then the butcher said, well, this way you get to enjoy them twice. You get to love them twice. You get to love them twice. That's right. You get to love them twice. And I found that so accurate 
you know, and just I, cause we eat, we, we slaughter one of our own every couple of years. And so we eat Fallon raised beef um, at our place. And, and when I was a little kid, I had a hard time understanding that because I just loved them and I didn't want to eat anything I had named. Um, but now I understand that I just get to love them twice and society gets to benefit from it. Yeah, 100 percent. You're 100 percent correct. You know, it's um, I wish I wish I don't know, man, you know, these big NGOs, you just like I did a little bit of research on WWF and, you know, this is I think the, the data that I got was like 2020 or 2019 or something like that. And it was like the general revenue that came in that year was 404 million. Right. 298 of that million went to salaries. Um, you know, the CEO was making it looked like there was some sort of incentive package based. So, you know, they were, he was making over a million. It looked like over four or five years. But then you had 14 or 15 people that was, you know, making over half a million, you know, or, or over 350 or something like that. It was like incredibly high salaries, like crazy high salaries, like a for profit company kind of high salaries. Now, I guess at that point in the game, again, I don't want to dog them too much, but I guess at that point in the game, when you're that big, it is a absolute gigantuan business machine. It It is. And I don't, you know, like the WWF, I've been to, I think it was a zoo in Albuquerque. And they have boxes everywhere so that all of everywhere. the people at the zoo can just like drop change into these boxes. And so they are just constantly getting money from people who I think are expecting them to spend their money on conserving you know, habitat. Huge swaths or, of panda um, habitat in China. Yeah, yeah, some, something like that. And, and you dig into this and that's just not what's happening. And I actually... When I did my most recent video, because I told you earlier when I did all this research on the Center for Biological Diversity and I pulled their specific numbers, that was about a year ago. Um, and then I was actually sent a news article that had some of these organizations and um, what their CEOs were being paid. And I thought, oh, yeah, you know, I should dive back into this because it is something that people deserve to know. And so, um, you know, for WWF, um, the Carter Roberts, the president and CEO, was paid one million two hundred and four thousand seven hundred and seventy five dollars in one year. Um, and earlier today, when I pulled the Center for Biological Diversity's uh, 990 form, they are paying um, lower salaries. They're still very high. Um, Kieran Suckling made, I think, half a million dollars. But then on here, it said that the expected compensation was like $45,000 or something. Mm. And so they are paying literally hundreds of thousands of dollars more than what would be expected from an organization like this. And that's yeah, part I of what just say, floors me. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say the CEO, that would be crazy to have a CEO's salary of an organization like that being 45 Gs. That would be like, yes, uh, it would. I know people who, I know people who fletch arrows for just a little bit less than 45 G's. Yeah. So <laughs> I would expect that, you know, a big CEO of a big nonprofit organization is probably in my brain, again, quarter of a million, 250, 280. I get that. That's not unreasonable. If you are a part of this gigantic machine i don't know you know it just it's it's tough when you start looking at numbers and paying you know i don't know yeah yeah and and i would agree with you you know especially in today's economy in most places you can't live off of forty five thousand dollars a year and so it does make sense that you would get more than that but what i don't understand is you know they fill out these forms and so I don't understand why the estimated amount of compensation is $45,000 and the actual compensation is, I, I, I was wrong a little bit. I 
I have the 990 right in front of me because it's very important for me to be correct. Um, Kieran Suckling made $339,911 in 2021. And so while that's certainly better than WWF making over a million dollars in one year, I still don't understand the discrepancy between what we would expect to pay and what we're actually paying. Yeah, it's funny, you know, the other thing that's interesting to me, because again, I run a nonprofit, I have a salary myself. And for in order for the Board of Blood Origins to determine the appropriate, they call it the reasonableness determination in the IRS. Have you heard about this? I have not really been involved in a nonprofit before, so I'm not sure. So you have to you have to go through a whole analysis. GuideStar has like this book. Here's another racket for you. GuideStar has this book. It's like 350 pages. It costs you 300 bucks to get. Okay. And what it does is it breaks down everyone's salaries everywhere, every position, regionally, locally, nationally, internationally, whatnot. And what you have to do if you're standing up a nonprofit and you have to do uh you have to assign a salary to someone you have to go through a reasonable deter reasonableness determination and you have to put this analysis together to say this is why we're paying this person x because the comparables are you know a b c d e and the um the nuances if you want to call them nuances or differences are X, Y, Z, and a calculation analysis of A, B, A through E and X, Y, Z equals this. It's fascinating stuff. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I mean, I've always assumed that there was some kind of a standard way to figure it out, but it sure, certainly seems like organizations like this are just <laughs> blowing it out of the water. <laughs> yeah, I would agree. I would agree. Well, look, you are... Uh, it's you know it's funny when you when you start having fun talking 45 minutes goes by it's very very quickly and yes, uh, it does. <laughs> you know I, I appreciate christy connecting us together um i really do um did, is there anything else on your heart that i forgot to 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 pull out when it comes to your radical environmental organizations you know the thing that i just always encourage anybody before they just donate money to some organization who says that they are helping you know these 990 forms are public go and actually look at what these organizations are spending their money on before you donate to them because everybody wants their money to go towards something valuable and people need to start doing the research on what those valuable things actually are because um you know the salaries of of these folks is not doing for the environment what you think it should be. Yep, 100%. 100%. Well said, Sarah Fallon. And uh, I can hear the wind picking up. It's crazy that you can hear the wind. It's that loud. It must be crazy just, outside. I'm so sorry about that. You know, and the wind is actually lower right now than oh it has God. been. Um, a few weeks ago, we had our cattle pot. We have a big trailer that we haul our cattle with on the interstate and it was just sitting in our pasture and it blew over um so we get really intense wind here so i'm I'm sorry if it's obnoxious in the background no no it hasn't been it hasn't been uh well i appreciate you let us know if we can do anything for you please reach out if you want to have a conversation about anything uh that's what we were built for so appreciate your time sarah absolutely thank you so much for having me